Hey everyone, welcome to Founders 365 with me, Stephen Haggerty. Today we have the founder of Silver Tip Digital, Mr. Henry Marshall, or Henners to his friends. But uh, <laughs> how are you doing today, Henry? Really well, thank you. How are you doing, Stephen? Yeah, good, thank you. This is, for, our, for everyone knowing, this is our second attempt at doing this. But it's, uh, I don't know why I tell people that. I'm just like, shoot myself in the foot. But, just oh, adds character. It's fine. Yeah, adds character. That's the right word. So, first question, as always, for all the guests, is what is Silver Tip Digital? So, Silver Tip Digital is an awesome performance marketing agency uh, that basically focuses on trying to kind of close the agency client divide. Um, so, we have like really close ties with all our clients, and we try and get to the nuts and bolts of um you know what it is that they're looking for from their performance marketing activity and uh to make sure that that, that they know that we know uh that you know they're spending a lot of money on ppc and paid social and so that we value that and um you know act accordingly because of it nice one and you've been going three years so one of the things that actually we spoke about in our pre-podcast chat is making that move from the one man band working in coffee shops to building out a team. Uh, you actually said something really interesting in the sense of the coffee shops got a little bit mundane. Talk me through about how that was. <clears throat> well, so I live in Bow and there's only probably about four coffee shops in <laughs> Bow that you'd want to spend any amount of time in. Um, so that got pretty mundane pretty quickly. And I used to do one coffee shop on a Monday one on a Tuesday, one on a Wednesday, one on a Thursday, and then work from home on Friday. Um, none of them have particularly comfortable seating. So that was uh, something I noticed pretty quickly. And you got a pretty bad back because, you know, your laptop was on the table sort of thing. Um, but generally, like the one-man band days were amazing in terms of not having any responsibility with regards to um, staff costs or office costs or anything like that. Um, but and, and so you had like loads of freedom to do kind of stuff that you want but obviously the the value that you get from having a team um is you know it's huge and being able to delegate and to split the workload and all that sort of stuff is obviously a massive benefit now um but we've we've built the team quite gradually so um there were two of us for about a year uh, over a year about sort of uh, 14, 15 months. And yeah. then um, I was, and then, so I hired Joe and he was, he's, he's amazing. Um, and then being able to sort of sh share the workload and grow the business a bit further, uh, we were able to hire um, someone that I worked with previously at House of Fraser, um, who was, is much more proficient in the paid social side. Um, whereas my speciality is the PPC side. So it was, we, it allowed us to, broaden what we are able to sell to our clients and, and manage for our clients yeah um, so how did your um how did your relationship change with the business throughout that time because obviously if you're going from that one-man band working in coffee shops bringing on someone else bringing on a third person you as the founder how did it change yeah so in the first year and a bit it was a very per it is a very personal business because um, it is essentially an extension of yourself. Um, and then, you know, when you when you sort of broaden that out to invite other people to to work under the brand, you you know it dilutes a little bit, but also you have to be a lot more responsible in terms of your professionalism. You know, you don't have to. Obviously, you're always professional. You try and always be professional for your clients, but then you actually it's almost like you've got to be inwardly professional as well. So, for example, you know, like having I'm just making sure that uh, you know the, the team members feel like they're actually in a proper job. Yeah. So it feels like I think the the biggest way that my sort of relationship with the business changed was it starting out as almost like a hobby that kind of you know paid paid the paid the bills, and then it sort of developed into actually you know a thing that people kind of took notice of and. Uh, it meant that I had to sort of be a bit more serious about it. Mm. And I think, yeah, it, the the sort of, the, I have to be way more serious and sort of responsible now, I'd say. You sound really reluctant to do that as well. 
Oh. Well, I think <laughs> I think it's always nice to like work work in an environment that allows you to kind of be yourself. Mm. Um, and I think that's one of the key things that I want to try and maintain, like with my team and and um, you know the environment that we've built for everyone to work in is is one of expression and uh you know there's a lot of you know there's no worries about like working from home or you know getting you know doing like life stuff as well as the work and yeah. you know you and we've only... look if they're like coming at five past nine and you look at your watch you're like oh, you're late well so i mean i wouldn't know because i'm usually the last person <laughs> in and i'm like i kind of like I, you know, I obviously pay my way and stuff, and like this, <laughs> I do do, you know, I do work hard. I love how like now that. you're trying to justify it. You're like, <laughs> yeah. no, I, I, I can, I can do that. <laughs> Is that well? That's quite an interesting point, actually, because you know, you do. There's a fair amount of introspection that that goes on in terms of like, you know, what, you know, you've got these people who are performing a function for the, the business, and you want to make sure that you're doing right by them. And so, you know, are you contributing as much as you should be or could be, mm. um, you know, all these different things. And so I feel like there's, you know, there needs, there's a, there's way more introspection now than, you know, than obviously when it was just me, because I was just sort of like bumbling around. But yeah, um, yeah it's, how do, you, it's in, how do you know that? How, do, how are you judging that at the moment? And how do you know when you are doing enough or not doing enough? Uh, I think that's a good question. So I think like the um, so how the company grows and making sure that um, you're kind of securing cash flow and you know you, you've got a roadmap in terms of when's when are the lights going to go out if if you know yeah. everything stayed the same as it is and um, that changes pretty rapidly and so you know I feel like I I justify a lot of it with. Um, you know, there's a fair amount of stress involved with, you know, when you lose a client or, you know, if, if circumstances change and um, say a trial period with a client doesn't turn into, you know, a 12 month contract or whatever. And, and then yeah. you've got to, you then got to kind of pivot and try and sort of find that next piece of business. So there's obviously a fair amount of stress with that. Um, um, so I feel like that's, that's like half of the battle. Um, and that justifies a lot of it, but um, yeah, I think making sure that the roadmap and the the, the growth plan is like justifiable and mm -hmm. and uh, and viable, but also making sure that everyone in the team is happy. And I think mostly, you know, the sort of well, the atmosphere around the office is very positive. What um, sort of office are you in? Are you in like a co-working space? Yeah, so we we're in work life in on Bermondsey Street or just oh, yeah. on Bermondsey yeah. Street. Um, and we we've got an office upstairs, and we share it with a PR agency called Silver Thorn. Oh, uh, any relation? Yeah. No relation. It was a complete chance. How weird! Um, yeah, and we were thinking of like tinfoiling the office, but we thought it might get a bit too cold. <laughs> um, but the yeah, so, would be awful as well. Yeah, you just have to hang out the window. And it's yeah. Too, bit dangerous um but yeah so uh we've got four desks in that office and they've got mm -hmm. two and then um and that was that's also amazing because you know if you're trying to attract new talent to a business that's four or three three or four people strong um you know that's that's quite a niche working environment whereas if yeah. you can say well actually you know you'll be part of an, an office of six people and you'll also have the wider work life network which is which was hugely valuable for me when so you know um moving on from those coffee shops in bow where it was quite a sort of you know uh individual you know quite a, a, a lonely kind of experience for, yeah, for, a, for a bit of time to then go into work life where you have like loads of people mm. and all this sort of stuff um, but then also being able to advertise to not only, t you know, prospective team members, but also like prospective clients and stuff. Yeah. It just makes it a lot more sort of um, viable as a proposition. Exactly. When you were um, when you were expanding that team from, you know, you to the three you are now and moving and continuing on that growth, how important was that culture? Or did you even know about the culture because you were working from the coffee shop? So was it something that you were consciously aware of when you were growing so basically i don't really know why like silver tip has 
like where the ambition to grow an agency came from. <laughs> I think I basically thought, I remember at House of Fraser, which is where I was in my last full-time job, I remember thinking like, wouldn't it be cool to build a team and it'd be like 10 people strong mm. and it, everyone coming to work, really happy to come into work. It'd be, you know, a really nice environment and it just, you know, beers on a Friday or any, you know, bean bags, yeah. all the, all the corny stuff. Table. <laughs> yeah. All of that. Like, but just like a really happy environment. And wouldn't it be cool to just be like, you know, this sort of King, the Kings of your own little kingdom kind of thing. Mm. Um, so I think that is what kind of subliminally like stuck with me in this thing. Uh, Cause I don't, I don't think there was ever a turning point where I was like, right. So it's going to be a massive agency and blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. But is, that think, still the, is that still the dream to have that 10, 10 man strong? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Zero confidence there. Uh, yeah, no, no. Well, I think we'll we'll get to ten hopefully, and then see see where we're at. But um, yeah, what's I think more we'd... important, the ten or the uh, the beer fridge? Well, yeah, that's a good question. I think <laughs> the beer fridge will have to feature on the roadmap. I think. Yeah, <laughs> so the beer fridge enables you to get to the ten man. That's yeah. It. I feel like there's going to be a ceiling where it's like you can't attract any more staff yeah. if you haven't got a beer fridge. Here's, here's a question then. When you had that that vision when you were at House, and Fra- House of Fraser and then you set up Silver Tip and went and went for it, how how much has that vision changed over the three years you've been going compared to the strength it was when you were in that full-time job? Uh, I think it's it's definitely grown so i think like the i remember when i was at house of fraser looking at someone's website of a friend from school who has their own like creative agency like design agency and thinking like how on earth has this guy done that like he's got his own office he's got his he's got a team like how 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 am i in this like dead end job (laughs) and and he's like done that and then he's living living your life that you want yeah well i kind of thought that i wanted that at the time and then when you when you like take the steps to get to that point you you kind of take on new you know you realize new things like you're not just thinking about the grass is always greener on the other side Mm -hmm. you actually think you a you've got the positives and the negatives of your current situation and certain logistical challenges like learning how to run a limited company and like dealing with accountants and tax yeah. and all this sort of stuff um but then you kind of get into a position where you can you think right okay so we've got to a point um where we've we've actually got um four in the team total now uh-huh. um so we we um we've got to that point w- what do we need to do in order to kind of get to five people or get to six or you know what? What are the the next steps from that? So I think it it's continually evolving, but I think it's it's just a bit different because now it feels attainable, whereas before mm-hmm. it was like how I just don't understand how he's managed to do that, and it's so impressive. But actually, it's just like putting in those baby steps. Yeah. So now looking back, are you like more? Can you see the work that he's put in to make that happen? Yeah. But also, so when I was looking at his agency when I was at House of Fraser, I just had this enormous amount of admiration for it. And then when the shoe is on the other foot, I kind of, you know, I'm not very good at accepting like compliments or whatever. So it's always like, oh, you know, it's nothing, it's fine. But yeah. actually, like, I guess they are that you know, if from from the outside perspective, it would look, you know, like an achievement. But I suppose it's just been sort of you know trying to and did you um when you felt when you started out did you contact him did you ask him for help uh i i did i asked him if you really awkward if he no, ignored I, you and then he watches this <laughs> yeah <laughs> no so i i don't think i contacted him when i was doing uh when i was working as a one-man band but i did contact him when I was at House of Fraser and asked him if he wanted me to open a PPC uh, um, department for his agency, uh, which he did.
didn't really he, we had a little chat but he was like no it's <laughs> probably not gonna happen but now now that i know like obviously issues with like how expensive like taking on staff are and yeah and all of the sort of costs associated with like running the business i completely understand why he, t- he turned me down yeah. <laughs> like, it would have been a bit of a gamble i think Massive. Oh, yeah, it's funny when you're when you're in a job versus the business owner. It's very different conversations you have with yourself, isn't it? Big time. Yeah. Um, so digital marketing, I've said it once on this podcast before. I'll say it again. It's a busy old market, right? It seems like every man and their dog has a di- digital marketing agency. Yeah. Is this something that, as a as a digital marketing agency owner, is this something that you're aware of and you can feel in that marketplace? Yes. Yeah, so one of the things um, in terms of like the the kind of realizations that I didn't even think about when I was kind of, you know, thinking about or subconsciously thinking about starting an agency was how competitive the landscape is. And mm-hmm. there are times when it seems like every day I'm finding a new competitor and I'm just like, how, <laughs> like, how many more people are they going to be? Uh, for us to like fight and scrap with it seems like for every 10 clients there's an agency Mm. Uh, and it's just yeah it's hugely congested Um, but I think it also allows you to look at how people do like how people sell set up and sell their agencies and so if you go on to each of their websites there's different things that you can kind of garner there's different like positions people take and I think like for us it's the experience of being in-house and working agency side and you know we're able to kind of preempt the questions that your stakeholders are going to ask you Mm. because we have been in that position where we're speaking to those stakeholders and also things like tying back um like actual business KPI so no one really cares what a Google conversion is because yeah. it does it, it, it inherently is nothing it doesn't mean anything it's just a piece of code but actually what does that mean in terms of revenue and sales and return ad spend and margin and everything like that what does that actually mean for the business so i do feel you, like that that's our angle are you finding that when you go in for pitching they're having more conversations with other people now yeah, there's always a few agencies in the mix. And I think um, that that's fine. It's kind of, it is a bit, it was a bit disconcerting to begin with. I mean, it's yeah. always been, there's always been a few agencies. I wouldn't say there's there's necessarily more agencies. I think uh, businesses tend to draw up a shortlist and, mm. you know, so it's whether or not you get on the shortlist, I suppose. Um but yeah, so it is disconcerting when you're in a pitch process and there's other agencies and you know that you're like the third slot or something, and it's like, yeah. you know, what 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 have the others said? <laughs> what <laughs> they said? How much are they pitching for? Can we Whatever do they said. Yeah. yeah, we'll go cheaper. It's fine. <laughs> exactly. So the first two that you've spoken to, they do this. We do the exact same. But we do it because of a smile or something like that. Uh, yeah. One thing I did find funny on your website is on your team page it's it look it's like a a graduation of beard length as you go down it's <laughs> yeah, i'm trying <laughs> i'm trying <laughs> i just i just drew my hair i look about 10 years younger i hate it i didn't realize until i got in this camera i was like oh my god where's my beard gone um <laughs> yeah anyway, we're digressing for you what where can you see like the marketing agency world moving into and evolving over the next couple of years because i think there's been a huge shift in the past couple of years with you know more agencies coming about the the offerings even though they're based you know the core offerings have all effectively always been the same the wording of the offerings have been different and the packaging up of it but where can you see that shifting to next <clears throat> well i think technology is obviously a massive sort of driver of that and i think all the work with scripting and automation and everything like that that's only going to accelerate with uh, or accelerate in pace and i think eventually you'll get to a point where um like google ads and facebook ads are will be sort of almost like self-managed platforms and i think yeah. you're already seeing that with 
like bid management stuff in both those platforms and um you know things like in google ads you've got all the different um uh opportunities and you know you can apply the opportunities and they make you know pretty wide scale changes to the account at the click of a button but i think you're always going to have to have um i think you know that sort of the relationship with google and the business so because you know google are earning money off that advertising channel and facebook doing the same there's always going to have to be i think um that sort of third party like mediator to yeah. try and just ensure that effectively you know what what google want to spend their money on all these broad match keywords or whatever they're they're okay for the business but they're not necessarily going to be the most efficient and mm -hmm. you know it's it's about it's about how you manage that relationship with google and how you manage the expectation of the client and also you know working out when during the year you know you need to spend the, the budget in order to kind of hit your targets and i think one of the massive like bits of experience of working in house is actually working to that annual plan and kind of feeding all the different elements of a big business into essentially one sort of cost line, which is the PPC spend. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, I think, I think it's almost like technology is only going to increase in, in, in pace and, and the complexities of what it will be able to do. But I think you, you're going to have to, there's going to, there's always going to be that kind of handbrake of like, you don't want to give total control, even yeah. if in some cases, total control is going to be the most optimal in terms of performance, because, you know, it allows the algorithms to kind of work like unfettered. I think you still, there's still going to be that trust issue that people, you know, will take a few years to get over. Mm. And having a third party like like yourselves, I think also limits the amount of emotional spending. Let's put it that way. You know, where someone goes, I need this now. So they put such a big budget on something where it's not properly organized or, or set out and blow it effectively and not get the results they want. Whereas you, having you as that third party, you know, very independently unbiased approach is, I, that's how I see marketing agencies changing much more in that space and more in the I think more in terms of that education route for clients teaching them okay these are the best methods you know or, yep google works here but actually there's this new thing you know like I don't know like tiktok right this is new tiktok yeah. and you can go down this route where people aren't going to be so much known about it because they're so in their business um you know tiktok's a great example I think of people not realizing some potential out there um yeah. i'm not sure you know house of fraser are going on tiktok or anywhere like that uh, they might well, I don't know. yeah old mike, old mike ashley being on tiktok <laughs> apparently he's massive on it yeah he loves it he? he's just always I, he's always doing the farmyard I, dance thing yeah. whatever that is disclaimer um, I, I don't know that That's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please don't sue henry mike if you're listening but if you are listening mike yeah. come on the show <laughs> yeah, you imagine if Mike, if Mike Ashley was listening, God, we could do a panel, Mike. Let's do a panel. And yeah. like, you know, we could thrash out what happened to House Fraser post Sports Direct. Oh no, were you there when it all happened? No, so I left a year, uh, a year or eighteen months before it all okay. sort of went down. But yeah, a, a few people I know were still there, and apparently it was a, a, quite a strange time. I bet it's um he it's retail is a, I think one of those industries which is just so versatile still because of people aren't and I think what the issue is this is a real tangent but a lot of people don't understand how businesses are run mm. because when they're in retail for them it, obviously it's their job it's a salary all that kind of stuff but when you start running your own business and you and you start looking at some of the stuff that goes on you're thinking actually no that's a that's a really good strategic decision from that company, or that's a really bad strategic decision from that company, um, which I think only people that run businesses can see, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it's it's very easy to kind of see how the costs kind of stack up. Mm. And, and actually, like, you know, if you kind of have an initiative that costs, you know, I don't know how much, like 10 grand or whatever, and then, you know, the payback of that, you know, every business has got cash flow 
yeah. um, considerations, not necessarily problems, but you know they have to think about when they're going to spend the money, and you know what that means in terms of like tax and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's it's um, it's it's hugely important to kind of understand mm. like what is feasible with the money that you've got in the bank. Exactly. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you actually about Silvertip was, like I said, when I was on your website, there's a huge sense of personality. I love that when you're scrolling to the bottom, you're like, oh, you've scrolled to the bottom. You must have read all our great content. Um, <laughs> things like that. Why was it important for you when you were designing the website and get and putting the content on there to have humor and personality and in my view, very real? Um, well, I'll tell you why, because I've gone through a few iterations of the website. And I've gone, I went down the sort of serious route where it's like, you know, we, we are, you know, we are incredibly important that we are trustworthy for your business and all this sort of stuff. And it, and basically I just got so many like comments from like my friends and family. It's like, wow, your, your website's so serious. Like, <laughs> what, why is so, <laughs> yeah. like what, what's going on? Like, were you in a bad mood when you wrote it or something? And uh, and I just thought, and and also like it wasn't designed particularly well. So I had like lots of feedback about how it was basically rubbish looking. So I just uh, I, I basically taught I learnt, taught myself how to use this like other thing to try and make the website. And I just was like, you know what? I'm just gonna write it as if I don't really care who's on it. I'm just you know I'm just gonna put all of my sort of like what I think should be in it. Um, and just see what happens. And the, it's been, there's been, we've had some positive feedback from it. Um, there's still a few issues with the font size on mobile, but you know I'm going to work out how to yeah. do that and, <laughs> and change <laughs> that. And, uh, do, you yeah. th- do you think having having like a personality on your website and uh, in your brand in total really um, helps you get work with the clients that you want to work with? Yeah, I feel like there's, um, so as, as we were talking about before with, you know, like the sort of LinkedIn messages and the 12 LinkedIn messages you receive a day and, you know, there's there's so much stuff on the internet and especially around PPC and digital marketing, mm. performance marketing. There's so much, like, there's so many people doing it and there's everyone needs it, but there's so many people, like, providing it as well. And so, and I think like it's very easy for for personalities to kind of, um, or or for you to kind of forget to put the personality in yeah. each of the messages or the you know uh, your website or whatever it is. So I feel like you know you just need that kind of concerted effort to to make it more um, more personal, I guess. But yeah, it's it's not an easy thing to do. I think a lot of people fear being themselves online. Yeah, I feel like LinkedIn is a bit like um, the Wild West sometimes. Like you've got <laughs> the real gunslingers who like they have utter conviction in everything that they do and say, and that kind of and I've, I'm I'm guilty of being a little bit like intimidated by you know this guy who's up at six a.m. and he's you know done yeah. fifty sit-ups or whatever by six fifteen, and I'm you know just like how can I relate what I'm trying to do with my business? uh you know position the sort of genial like we will do right by you but also it would be nice to work with us in that environment where it's like you know look at my six pack you know yeah <laughs> and it's just like it's quite difficult to kind of i don't know think think about how the uh how you'd position that and then you get the linkedin police where if you post a photo of your dog they go this isn't facebook <laughs> yeah exactly and then you've got and also obviously the increasing like political stuff there's a lot yeah. more politics on there and then but you don't want to say anything you know on about politics because what even if you have like the most mild view there's going to be someone that opposes it and then and you don't want that attached to essentially your livelihood how do you how do you get seen then how do you personally get seen on linkedin i use linkedin as well as i can do so we we do do a lot of like um, like connecting with people that we want to be connected with and try and you know we always uh, personalize the connection note to make sure that they know that we're sort of you know why we're linking with them and we, we try and be as upfront and you know apologetic about the out of the blue you know 
so <laughs> British of you. I'm so, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm really sorry. I, I'm very sorry to connect, but <laughs> no, it's literally like that. So I'm so, I really massive apologies for the out of the blue message, but <laughs> um, so we do that. But we, I think, I mean, me personally, I need to be a lot more co- like I need to start producing content around paid search and stuff like that and be a bit more of a thought leader. Um, but again, but it's just you know. It's just putting it out there and then seeing kind of what comes back and you know as you say that there are linkedin police but also it's like you've got an opinion on how a campaign should be structured and then you put it you know you write a piece of content you put it on linkedin and then you get like 50 comments like no i wouldn't do that (laughs) oh no that's not how you do it it's still good good marketing though it still means you get seen Yeah, it's true. It's all about the engagement. That's it. I'm sure your I'm sure your um office buddies, the PR company, would say it's all still good PR. There's Absolutely, nothing, no such Absolutely. thing as bad PR. Is that what people say? Isn't it? That's what they say. Yeah, but I'm yeah. I'm not I'm not not so convinced. <laughs> I have seen some disasters on LinkedIn, and uh, it's gone very bad. Luckily, I've not had that personal experience, but I've seen it, and it's it's not pretty. It is, it's a weird platform. It's so yeah, important. It it's like it's a hugely important platform and one that you need to get right. But it, yeah. it, it's it's weird how people behave on it sometimes. It, I think all social media is though, because it's like Facebook. You have to be. I say you have to. It's like you're meant to be a certain person on Facebook. You're meant to be someone else on Instagram. You're supposed to be someone else. But it's like when I first started with the coaching thing. I had like a very serious Facebook pro, uh, LinkedIn profile. I had the headshot, I had all that. And then I remember last year, I just was like, oh, screw that. You know, I'll just, if whenever my clients spend a day with me, it's not serious. It's just like we're having a really good time. We're doing a lot of cool stuff. We're doing a lot of strategy. And I'm not that person that rocks up in like a three piece suit with yeah. perfectly <clears throat> polished shoes. I do not, I don't have the time for that. Yeah. So if you if you look on my LinkedIn profile, there's a video of an interview that I did for Adobe Summit um, in like 2015, and it is the most serious and <laughs> boring like version of myself that I have like. And at the time, I thought it was like really professional. Yeah. And, you know, and then I just I look back on it and just think like anyone What's watching that would <laughs> yeah, you'd just be like so bored. And I guess that feeds into the thing we were talking about earlier about like why you know what you want to what you want to bring what off what environment you want the team Mm. to work in and for where you can be yourself and not have to be so hung up on you know like being super professional and and yeah basically boring i guess i'm a firm believer that there's enough business out there that you can just be yourself to the maximum potential and people are going to like it and the people that don't like it there's a perfectly boring agency that will you know kiss your totally. ass or whatever you want to do yeah yeah, yeah. and <clears throat> we've you know we, we've worked with a few businesses now and the spectrum of people that i've met is mad <laughs> and we you know the the people that we work with now are all people that we want to work with because like there is a personality thing and there's a lot yeah. of people out there who are like perfect working colleagues you know perfect but there is a small niche of like you know sp- like weird people that it's like just it's very difficult to work with them just yeah. all manner of kind of personalities and so- sometimes you do just get like a natural personality clash and it's like weird like why is this so why is this so much more difficult now than it is you know the meeting that we had two hours ago <laughs> weird yeah but i think the, the more people you're working with that match that personality it's just more fun and you're yeah. not in business not to have fun you know yeah and also it's um you know yeah you you want it to be fun i remember when i was at house fraser like um you know the the talking to agencies from the in-house point of view like you don't need to be like um you know mean to them or make yeah. them you know they are still people just trying to do their job or whatever and I feel like there, you know, it's very easy to be like, you know, when you're when you're sort of ordering people about for it to be like, you know, oh, I'm I'm not going to sort of treat you like a sort of I don't know other no ordinary person or whatever. It yeah, is. I don't know. 
it's weird. It, there's it, it, people kind of get a little bit on their sort of on their title. I think. Mm, interesting. The world is an interesting place, then. People are weird. Let's put it that way. Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> me too. I'm a weirdo. <laughs> yeah, everyone's a weirdo. Everyone's a weirdo. Yeah. If we were all the same, how boring would the world be? Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Like, no. Um, so tell me, what is coming up for you this year with Silvertip? What's happening? What are you going to do? So we, I mean, that's a, that's a big question. Um <laughs> We've only, we've got we've got revenue targets, which is uh, that's, that's a good, we didn't have, good start. Yeah, we didn't have those before. Um, and my role in 2020 has changed a lot more into like the biz, business development side of things. Um, so I, we've got you know we we've got we know what our capacity is in terms of everyone's now on timesheets. Ooh, but it, <laughs> you know, it's pretty, pretty important for the business. Yeah. Um, so we are we're way more structured and um way more sort of commercial in terms of the time of the team and i think that is going to be a massive thing in terms of understanding when a new lead comes through and under you know sort of being able to forecast like how much resource we can put towards that and all that sort of stuff yeah. so being more structured and being more like serious and and like you know serious business type type vibe will help us i think get to our revenue target but I think also we just want to make sure that we're sort of so we're at four people at the moment. I'd love to be able to get that up to six by the end of the year or, or nice. even more, I don't know. But um yeah, I think just continue doing some cool work with some cool clients and making people happy, I guess. That's it. <laughs> That's it. I love that. Listen, Henry, thank you so, so much for coming on. Uh if anyone wants to like chat to you or get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, so you can either go to silvertipdigital.com and you can WhatsApp me from the website. Oh, modern technology. That <laughs> is so 2020. Um, or feel free to email me at henry at silvertipdigital.com. Nice one. Easy. Thank you for coming on. You have been guest number 24, which is crazy. Uh, yeah, thank you. This has been Founders 365. I've been Stephen Hagdy, and this has been Henry Marshall from Silvertip Digital. Thank you very much. Cheers.